So in addition to the Chester Historical Society material, I combined some ephemera from the Al Malpa Historical Society. <laughs> so, and I'll point out which is which. Um, the word ephemera, often people ask me, what, what does that mean? Uh, most people are unfamiliar with it. Well, it means that a piece of printed or manuscript material that was only printed for short-term use. For instance, the ladies who so kindly gave the food preparation today, they brought in bags to keep the flies off the food. <laughs> so they lay these on top of the food before you got here. But this bag is actually from the Chester, the original. Uh, this is the original. From the Chester General Store. Um, and was probably given out, I think, in the 1980s. So the owner who was here had a few extra and brought to, for the practical purpose of keeping the flies away, and for the ephemeral purpose, because after that served its purpose, it was probably could be disposed of. But they're so they're so interesting. I'm sure she's going to keep it. Actually, I'm going to keep this one right here. Um, we all carry around ephemera. Uh, it's probably in your pockets now, in your in your uh, purses, and. Um, I was wondering, I was checking myself today to see if I had anything ephemeral on me when I got here. And I found in my pocket a poop bag. <laughs> now, believe me, this is really ephemeral. It's kind of one-time use, and then you throw it away. You know? And uh, we, have a, we have a dog named Josiah. And so I always carry one of these with me. And then I thought, oh, what a great collection, poop bags. Because they... <laughs> Because they all, if you notice that here, it's got the, like the cutest little dog on it. So it would be interesting to see what kind of artwork people are putting on their poop bags today. <laughs> so you might want to start collecting them soon. In fact, if you, if you like one of these, stop by the house and I'll give you one. So this is, a, this is my first piece of this collection. <laughs> on this table is books about ephemera, which you're, you're uh, welcome to come up and look at. And then I brought some tree ring binders of ephemera, just a few, so you can see the things in, in the flesh. And, uh, uh, oh, we have, a, we have a newspaper from Chester, uh, dated 1936. So although it's not, you can't take it apart and look at it, because by the 1930s, paper being used for newspaper was made of wood pulp. So what happens, see how brown this is? So the acids disintegrate the paper. So a paper from the 1930s, you, you pick up, like, we're going to take it out of here. In fact, I can see, I know you can't see it, but there's little flakes of paper under the wrapping because it's falling apart already. Now, if you have a newspaper from 1810, you could stick it in the, in the uh, bathroom sink and wash it, and hang it up to dry, you'd be fine. And no deterioration at all, because that was made of cloth. But later on in the 19th century, they started putting wood pulp in paper, and that was, that was the end of the newspaper trade in the old cloth type. By the way, the newspapers, that's a whole area of collecting. Uh, I have a friend who put together millions of these and uh, sold them to the museum in uh, Washington. And uh, from that, he retired for life at the ripe old age of 30. Uh, but a lot of this stuff is really sought by institutions, libraries, and it, it's often adjunct to special air exhibitions that the museums are mounting. So if you went to the Smithsonian and you went to the American History Museum, You'd be astounded, as I was, to see all the ephemera they've got. Practically in every display, they have ephemera from the period. They do so because the ephemera reflects the culture at the time, the history at the time, in a way that you uh, bring you closer to 
the actual events, and then read them in a, in a book. So you read it about it, you know, you read about uh, Ben Franklin in a book, and it's kind of, you kind of know about it a little bit out there, but when you see a print made by Ben Franklin, you actually had something in your hand that he had in his hand. So uh, there's a, a lot of realism that it brings to light. So uh, I'm often asked, where does ephemera come from? Well, this is a great place. <laughs> Because the town collects ephemera every week. <laughs> Isn't that nice? So if you, if you see me bent over a trash can, I'm, I'm not looking for old pizzas, but I may be looking for pizza boxes. Uh, and that's the way it's been for hundreds of years. And some old collector friends that I have that passed away now, they used to go to the dump and pick out, at the time, early part of the century, pink was put in bales and brought to the dump. They used to pull out these most wonderful things from the 19th and even the 18th century. Uh, Rocky Gardner uh, from Stanford, he told me a story where he went to a dump and pulled out a receipt from the Chippendale uh, furniture manufacturer for a set of chairs that he sold back in that same, in the same period. So it's, it's really all around us. Uh, what else are we here? Oh, <laughs> this is very typical. You wouldn't, you throw, right, you throw these away, you put them in the bag, you bring them home, you dump them out. But you can learn a lot from these. For instance, you see here that this particular buyer bought Philip Berio virgin olive oil, and in fact bought four bottles of it. And then they bought Goyer beans, of course the low sodium, being health conscious. So what are they gonna do with this? What does it tell us? It tells us that evening they're gonna make pasta de jour. Right? <laughs> so, uh, it, and it's interesting, if you were to look back at these receipts, just grocery store receipts back to the, the 30s and 20s, it's a whole, it's a whole different world that it, it opens up. I'm sure you don't think of it too often, but the information is there should you like to find it. This is in the Chester Collection, uh, Historical Society Collection, and it's a deed. A deed is not ephemeral. A deed was made to be recorded, kept forever. And this deed is uh, from 1741, uh, and it's deeding a piece of property to uh, Thomas Jones. And what he's being deeded, what's being deeded to him, is coming to him from the king of uh, England. I think it was George II. Uh, so in 1741, George had been on the throne for 15 years already. So, this, although the piece is 1740s, it's got a lot of history in it itself. Now, interestingly enough, he's buying from Saybrook all of the land, quote, called Patacock land. And Patacock land is uh, that land right around here. And he's paying the sum of 20 pounds and five shillings, which today equates to 3,555 bucks. So land by the acre was very, very cheap, probably pennies. You know. But the Historical Society has quite a group of these, even some earlier. And uh, nicely, they're, they're in good shape and they're, the handwriting is really very readable. This is a Chester Historical Society piece. It's from the inside of a ledger. Uh, and the owner, back in uh, 1814, drew a map of Chester in the, on, on, on the first board when you open it up. And that's what this is glued to. And here's a close-up of it. So they actually put the names of the people Reynolds, Webb, what is Watchers right here? Watch this house. 
and here's the village. Is it? In fact, right here is the meeting house. So this is a this is a historical record that there's only one of it. It's not like you pick up a you've seen the maps, you buy it antique shops and whatnot, and they're printed and taken out of a out of a uh, atlas. But this is early 1815. Now, last week we were at, uh, at a, a book fair in uh, Brooklyn, New York. We were doing a, there was a hundred book dealers, all real book dealers. And there was only two paper dealers, ourselves and actually some friends of ours from Vernon, Connecticut. So when you go to a book fair as an exhibitor, you want to scour the book fair before anybody else comes in to find things that you might miss. And I had to have permission first, which Kerry gave me at this moment, at that time. <laughs> and it was, it was short because we had a lot of people in our booth because we were the only paper dealers. Uh, so this piece here was in a guy's booth, Richard Thorner, and my friend of mine, uh, Ralph Gallo, he's got a box of, a uh, cardboard box with plastics in it. He's going through them. And I figured, oh, Ralph is going to cream this box. He's going to get anything that's good in it. But then he hands the box to me. And I start looking through it. And I'm dumbfounded, dumbfounded by this piece here because this is from about 1815. Now, at that period of time, business cards, they were just tight, woodblock tight. But this particular gentleman, Paul Spear, Jr., He's making ships medicine chests, which today are highly, highly collectible. I've never seen one in the marketplace. I've seen them in museums. And this guy's a manufacturer of them. And he put the engraving of the chest in the center and the medicine being prepared. And a view, which I'm pretty quite sure this is going to be Boston Harbor. And the two Another fellow was with me said, oh, that's English, but that's not right, because these two engravers, Williams and Anna, they're recorded as being engravers in Boston at the time. So it's, uh, it's really a, a terrific piece. This is interesting. It's a, it's a Chester Stone factory that's being auctioned off. <laughs> It says here, the principal building is of stone, three stories high, 70 feet by 35 feet on the ground with an adjoining apartment, one story high, and about 30 feet square, intended as a meta machine shop. The water wheel is overshot, 27 feet in diameter, and eight feet bucket, and runs with from 24 to 30 horsepower. Note the date here, 1843. A few rods from this building is a row of 10 distinct tenements under one roof for the accommodation of 10 different families and a good single dwelling house, barn, and about 40 acres of land. The water privilege being at the outlet, outlet of a natural pond with its capability for improvement is not inferior to anyone in Middlesex County. The establishment is not exceeding three miles from navigable waters of Connecticut and not exceeding four and a half miles from the steamboat landing at Deep River. Satisfy the public the perfect fairness, that perfect fairness will characterize the sale. The bidders are assured that no person will act as an underbidder. So I, I think you probably gather what that means. The owner will sometimes would send in bidders to bid it up. Uh, and so this is uh, Eli Warner. It's, it's in great shape. It's about, it's about this big, and it's uh, woodcut printed. This is for uh, a mill in Chester known as Augers Mill, mm -hmm. now ready to grind wheat, rye, corn, oats, and buckwheat for grain or cash. Chester, December 1st, 1860, J.W. Wilcox. Now these are, these are called handbills, really, and they are they were usually made at like a penny a piece by, by the uh, local job printer. Given to the purchaser, the purchaser would go out and nail them to the sides of buildings or 
not telephone poles. But. Uh, this is to Mr. Beach in Chester, Connecticut. Now, it's an empty envelope, but what's particularly interesting about it is this illustration. This is called a cameo or a corner card when it's on envelopes. And it's made from a plate that the white pot is engraved out of it, and then the plate would be inked, and it would be printed, and just so the white pot would then become the illustration of them. These are, these are really uh, highly sought of. The uh, uh, Huntington Museum bought a collection of them last year for 650000 uh, from another friend of mine. It was, it was a fabulous collection. This is, this is one I picked up at the show last week. And it's for a uh, A.J. Keller's Market House. And he's got illustrations of a goose and a steer. And particularly very interesting is the steer is embossed. So once they printed it, they would take uh, a, a die and blind emboss it just where the animal was. This is a Chester piece. And it's from the 1840s, 1850s, probably 1850s. Luther Boardman, manufacturer of block tin and Britannia ware, Chester, Connecticut, buff spoons, coffee pots and teapots, casters, lamps, shaving boxes, tumblers, porringers, and coffin plates. <laughs> now, this, at, at this period, 1840 or 50, this is the first time that this kind of paper stock was used, card stock. And the stock is, uh, it's a thick cod that's impregnated with clay and then pressed uh, under a great deal of weight so the, the clay marries with the cod. And the result is you get a very glossy surface. So when the inks are applied to it, the inks uh, almost have an iridescence to them and it holds, uh, it holds the ink very, very tightly in so much that you don't get any drifting of inks out of the letters. These cards were coming from cardstock. It was coming from Belgium uh, to begin with, probably about 15 years earlier. Now, this is a, a clipper ship card. They were manufactured in the 50s, 1850s, on that same uh, material. And they were used for shippers in New York who would hand them out to people to uh, try and get them to ship their goods. Or they always, always took a few passengers. And they most always travel from New York to San Francisco. Um, they were printed one at a time. The State Street Bank in Boston has the biggest collection in the country. Uh, and they have about 600 of them. And the American Antiquarian Society has probably got about four or 500 of them. Uh, same stock, coated stock. Uh, Button Volunteer Associates Ball, Winter Hall, Roxbury. This, uh, these cards, which were standard material for the printer, uh, were blank in the center, and people planning events would just come in and pick out a design, and they'd have them printed. Now, this is a real fancy one. It's engraved for the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And you know, when you run your hand over a piece of engraved material, particularly on, on a card, you can feel the ridges. You know, the ridges. So which you can very much stand out on this. Though so they could have obviously afforded to have, uh, often it was Tiffany who would grade these uh, to really spend some money on the design. This is just a common insurance company card, mercantile mutual insurance, inland transportation and marine insurance, put it on the same card stock, but this one has uh, a print uh, what would, would have been a late clipper ship at the time, and it's really finely engraved, and it's really quite nice. This is from Chester, closing out of the J.J. A. O'Connor shoe store. And where was that shoe store located? Where Tonic is now. Where Tonic is. You know, the new store in town on the corner. And he's selling boots and shoes and hats and caps and gents, gents furnishings. Interestingly, when these were designed, they were often printed in the 
as many different types of fonts that the printer has to draw your eye to them. Mm -hmm. And this particular one is the 16 different type fonts. Yeah. It's got a beautiful border on it. It's about this big. And what is that called? The broadside? It's called a broadside. Yeah, broadside. In the center of the illustration, see the train? Mm -hmm. The train's all made out of shoes. <laughs> so can you see there? This is a boot. These are shoes. There's a shoe there, a, two, a boot here, and a boot there. And in the center is an illustration of a gentleman in front of the fireplace with his boots on, warming them up. And boots here, and boots all over the place. There is a, uh, a booklet in, the, in your collection that's a book of premiums for uh, a, a, a agricultural fair in 1885. And this is the ad that O'Connor took, same guy who just left, in that, um, in that uh, publication. A few years later, he decides to make a trade card, which is what were the business cards at the time. And this is printed by chromo lithography. This here was printed via drawings on stones that are about this thick. And each drawing was a different color. So when they were printed, the task was to print the reds, like this guy here, and then we're going to print the greens. They had to take the card and then place it exact registration over the next stone so the color was in the same place. And all this, this is kind of a crude one, but it's got like five or six different colors. So five or six different kind, times. And in between, the ink had to dry before they went to the next one. So it was in the beginning, which was about 1860s, they started printing these. This is a little later. Uh, uh, what's that process called again? It's called chromolithography. And there are some tremendous illustrations done from the 1870s and 80s that were posters for uh, different events and products and whatnot. Just, it's mind-boggling the work they did. This is the store, the shoe store, which is tonic today, where the O'Connor had his business. <laughs> this guy here. He puts his face on the boot, and he's a, he's a shoe dealer. Now, I have probably several hundred of these kind of cards. That have, this is a, called the cabinet card, where a uh, person in business puts his portrait on it, and then the information. But this is the only one where I've ever seen where somebody put their face on the boot. <laughs> This is Chester, fish market. The undersigned would take, excuse me, the undersigned would take this way of informing the people of Deep River, Haddam, and Chester that he intends to keep a first class market of fish, lobsters, oysters, and clams, and that there will be a cot run to Haddam every Monday and Thursday, to Deep River every Tuesday and Friday, and in Chester every Wednesday and Saturday, commencing March 1st, market under tin shop. I don't know where the tin shop was, but there is some tin shop information a little later on. What time period was that? It's probably 87, 1860s, 1870s. Charles H. Knoxon. Now this is another fish cod, although not from Chester, it's from Providence. But at a certain time in the 1850s, orange stock became uh, very popular for a short period of time. And you'd find business cards printed on orange stock. And this one's unusual because it's got a lobster and fish on it. Uh, and there was a lady, Jean Berg, in uh, Granby, Connecticut, who wrote her. She was a dealer and who collected cards printed on iron stock and uh, I bought most of her collection and 
It's just some fabulous materials being done on iron. And after the 1860s, it's gone. Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a leaping fish. And the name of the company is Fish Brothers and Company, Racine, Wisconsin. They made the best wagon. They make the best wagon on wheels. Council Bluffs, Iowa. So they're being sold by agents in Iowa, but they're being made in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, the, the printing of this is pretty interesting. The fish is drawn out. The fish is about nine inches long. The fish is drawn out uh, on a stone. And then the instead of doing the printing one color at a time, the printer would paint across the fish different colors so that when you printed them, they all blended together. Can't, kind, kind of gave it this rainbow effect. And after it was dry, they'd have a dye that would cut it off the shape of fish. Keep in mind that people in the, people in the, 1870s, people in the 1880s and 90s collected all these things. They put them in scrap albums, and we'll see a chest of scrap albums soon. And then on weekends, times that they weren't working, they would get together with people in the community and show them a scrapbook of the items that they collected, which were usually business cards or invitations or all kinds of things. Uh, this is the third annual Calico Ball given by Chester Baseball Club. Thursday evening, April 24th, 1904. Right here is an arrow that says Mike. This guy right here with the muscle. <laughs> I, I take it that nobody knows who Mike was. But this was. It was a program. Yes, yeah. In, inside would be, uh, I didn't shoot the inside, but inside is a list of dances that they're going to have. And then you would sign up who you're going to dance with at each dance. Now, here's another calico ball, but it's printed on a piece of calico. And it says, ladies will appear in calico dresses, gentlemen in blue denim overalls, white shirts, and without coats and vests. That's what you had to wear to get in. And it says, uh, music by the Man Manchester Quadro Band, 1869. Now here's that, that uh, book of premiums, which the cover is not in great shape, but the inside is in great shape. For the ninth Annual Fair in Chester, dated Chester, October 1st, 1885. In it are lists of awards they were given. Now, keep, keep, in, keep in mind that uh, men and women of the, of the period would prepare all year for these gatherings. And there are little, literally hundreds of awards in this, in this uh, uh, booklet. And some of them are uh, best sample cambric embroidery, best painted fire screen, best painted bag, best embroidered bag, best painted bannerette. I don't know that. And they would go on and on and pages. It's just pages. And you get to the get to the farm animal section, and it says you know hogs on top, and it lists like 20 different types of hogs. I mean, all varieties, and these little ones and big ones they were separated by. But it just goes on and on and on. And but they're paying cash money. Seeing it right here, they're mostly all 30 cents first place and 20 cents second. From that same period, uh, the same uh, brochure, is this ad to learn to wall and get shaved at the Out West store in Chester, Connecticut. Yeah, I don't know where that was. Another Chester ad. Have you any leaky tinware? If you have, take it to Woodstock and Richmond's and have it repaired. We have fitted up a room in the basement of Burr's Block under Pratt's Hardware Store for the purpose of repairing tinware. Look at that typeface here. It's a beautiful typeface. Very nice. Uh, shop will be open evenings only at present, 7 to 10 o'clock. 
Waters may be left and he'd be fried during the day. <laughs> this one is for a, a Chester surgeon dentist <laughs> who points out teeth extracted without pain. <laughs> With a, with a preparation that is perfectly harmless and there is no after effects as hundreds will testify. <laughs> and right under it is the blacksmith <laughs> and John. So, if Mr. Gladwin was going to pull up one of your teeth, he would go to Mr. Church and get a pair of pliers <laughs> and hang them out. Uh, there's another great typeface here. Look at that. This is Hattie D. Pratt, dealer in ladies' furnishing and fancy goods, stamping a specialty. I'm not sure what that is. Chester, Connecticut. Years later, in a war ration book in the 1940s, it's made out to Harriet Pratt. Same lady. But probably, obviously, decades later. And by this time, she's 86 years old, she weighs 100 pounds, 5 foot 3 inches tall, and is retired. Now, where else would you find that information? You know, it's really, ephemera is a great source material because there are so many details of the period of it. And this is to the uh, Chester Agricultural and Mechanical Society ticket. They had a fear. Doesn't have the year. Oh, 1894. So you get one of these and you wear it around the fair. To advertise the fairs, um, the the uh, people who made agricultural equipment would print these cards up and hand them out prior to the fair, uh, so people would go see their wagons. Uh, and in this case, it's the American Fat Stock Show, 1882. And this is the prize steer, Tom Brown. I don't know if that's the steer's name or the owner's name. <laughs> it's a, when you stop and think, again, each color was printed from a different stone. And you I, I don't really show, maybe I have one example where the color goes outside the drawn figure. But for the most part, uh, they, they don't exist. Same thing here, lamb's tongues. That's the last time we had a good can of lamb's tongues. <laughs> uh, this company here, Thurber Company in New York, they were the largest grocers in New York, and they printed uh, individual, individually designed labels for all their products. There's a book of thermal labels here. And they, why they exist today, because the buyers of the canvas were so taken by the design, they would soak them off, and then they would put them in their scrapbooks. Now, 50 years ago, I came by a, a postcard dealer who had a couple, three dozen of these for a buck each and at an ephemera society event, um, we did an exhibition of Thurbalite. After that, they just went through the roof. And back in, probably by, by 2000, 2005, 2000, they were selling for $160 each. But today, they're back down to the $45, $55 range. Now this is from the Brooks and Sons Company in, here in Chester. 1899, manufacturers of bright iron and brass wire goods. Now this is an accounting. You can see at the time that they had in the bank $11,443.75. Cash in the safe, the safe, $177. In the machinery, they figured they got a hundred, uh, excuse me, 10,000, 
$10,476 worth of machinery. And another in stock, $114,088. Now, this is, this is a beat up building, as so many that survive on. But this is interesting because right across here, now, they're selling beef, lot, pork, ham, poultry, clear pork, and pork you can see through. This is uh, no meats warranted from flies unless covered. <laughs> so with people going into the stores and saying, hey buddy, flies are attracted to your meat. What's the matter with you? So they had to print this on here and say, look, if you don't put a cover over your meat, you're inviting flies. In Eden's trial, Chester Town Hall, 1895, 15 cents admission. And it says, you can't see it here, but uh, the synopsis is the girls in camp, Nan, Nan, Nan seeks a snapshot of Aunt Miller, and it goes on. It's, uh, the names on here is Miss Lee, Leet, Jager, Gilbert, Bates, Silman, Smith, Daniels, and Kirkland. Now, Silman family, as you know, um, were in the business of making ink wells. Historical Society U.S. has a fabulous collection of them. And some years ago, they came across this. Now, this is a, a reproduction of uh, an original that's owned by the Historical Society, selling the Silman ink wells. This is, you'd call this a trade catalog, even though it's one sheet. Most catalogs are multiple sheets. But it's showing what they make and what sizes they came in and how much they are. And these, uh, the historical society has the reproductions of them. I don't know if they give them away or do they have to buy them? No. Sell them? Sell them? All right. <laughs> Not a great example, but it, it opens up an area of real curiosity for me. This is a reward of merit. So, rewards of merit were given to kids, and the teachers would give these. This is one from the Chester collection. Uh, I had a uh, problem, I, well, I had the best collection of these in the country, and which I have. We did a book about here, uh, myself and a, and a lady from Wesleyan on Rewards of Merit, which are now in an institution. Um, and it speaks to the idea that positive reinforcement was actually being used in colonial days prior to it being uh, coined by Piaget and Thorndike in the 20th century. But this is, this is how the teachers were buying them. And this is printed by Magnus in New York about 1860. And the printers would have uh, ladies or boys who would, after printing, would color them in, kind of crudely, uh, but they sold faster. The schools didn't supply them. It was up, pretty much up to the teachers to supply these kind of awards. This is one, one such award. It was printed by the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in the 1890s. And it shows here, you know, the dog, another dog, or maybe that's two dogs, yeah. And the horse, and the dog is looks like he's handling, holding a uh, a crop. So these were given to kids to encourage them to be kind to animals. Now, this is an unbelievable piece. Uh, I got this probably 45 years ago. I got a call. I was running an ad in, uh, man in uh, Newtown B, and I said, I wanted to buy Rewards of Merit. And a woman called me. She said, my husband just died, and we have this Reward of Merit that we need to do something with. So I said, oh, OK, well, let me come down and see it. So I went down here. This piece is about this big. It's fabulous. 
it's a, it's a, for those who can't stand, we got a Native Americans, we got soldiers with a sword, we got martial soldiers with short swords, <laughs> and we got a cannon in the back with a flag. Uh, and it's, uh, it says a watercolor, excuse me, a watercolor reward bearer from a group of rewards received by Alfred Fowler in the 1820s in Milford, Connecticut, depicting an Indian conflict such as such it goes. This eventually went to, I sold it and went to a New York auction house and, and brought a, uh, too much money. <laughs> yeah. um, it Yeah, this is all watercolor, done by the teacher. Which is before those strips of three. Yeah, yeah, because this is in the 1820s, the other ones were from the 1850s. But some teachers, and if you look at my book, you'll see that they went through tremendous pain to create the was and merit. The artwork is just fabulous. So they're not only collected by uh, ephemera collected, but they're collected by folk art. <laughs> this is from uh, the collection here. It's called a uh, calling card. Thank you so much. <laughs> calling card, pretty bull guy. He's a resident jester, and the card is pre-printed, the color illustration, and then the printer would buy you know, 100 of them, and then he'd, he'd print the individual name on it. And it was the habit at the time that you'd go to somebody's house you leave your calling card on the table. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they had, you may have seen them, their uh, metal hands, uh, silver, uh, stretched out that are on the, on the entry table for you to put your card in. Now this one is a Spencerian one. Uh, so somebody made the effort to put the Spencerian design of a bird and then actually write their name on it. Some of these got very extravagant. I mean, I, I had a fabulous one that unfortunately I just sold, but it, it was multicolored and the person had put the sparkles on it, and it was tremendous. <laughs> lithography again, chromo lithography. Why I put this in here? This is just a, uh, a page of a calendar from 1872 to show you what Tremendous design was being done, and and the there were twelve very distinctly different uh, month designs in this calendar, and uh, again, keep in mind all different colors, all different stones, and they're highly collectible today. <laughs> this is a uh, a Bergen, I think it's a Bergen County Farmers Mutual Fire Insurance Company. And this is 1859, and why I put this in here was the illustration. You can see the, the bond is burning down in the back, and this guy is looking at his sheep. Now, what's going on there? I had a dealer say to me, kind of amorously looking at that sheep. No, I thought that was funny. Okay, back to Chester. Um, this is a, a little uh, uh, handbill from the Charles E. Lord seed store. 500 varieties in, in stock. Our seed, peas and beans and corn, extra quality vegetables and flowers, and it just goes on and on with pumpkins. And they were given, he was given a cash prize for uh, $50 for the largest sure head cabbage, $50 for silver king onion, $100 for the best ironclad watermelon, and another $100 for the best pumpkin. So he's referring to a, a fair. He's sponsoring these, these prizes at an at a agricultural fair. If you ever planted corn, you go out. It happens to me all the time. And I see all my corn look like this high, and then they all be gone. Well, you know who's doing it. 
damn crows. And they, there was, I never heard this, but there was a repellent, protect your seed corn, with Stanley's crow repellent. Crows hate it, it says. <laughs> <laughs> this is the better mousetrap. It looks kind of complicated. And uh, it says, I gotta read this there. It says, the mouse goes in to get the bait and shuts the door by his own weight. And then he jumps right through a hole and thinks he's out, but bless his soul, he's in a cage somehow or other and sets the trap to catch another. <laughs> I was, I was carried out with doing a show. A guy comes in a booth. And uh, he said, Do you have anything on mouse traps? Like, really, mouse traps. There's very, very little on mouse traps. Yeah. So I sent him a copy of this. And uh, I've never seen any, any mouse trap like this. So I thought he'd really be into it. But it was 40 bucks, and he decided that he couldn't make $40 for it. So luckily, I still have it. <laughs> this is Chester. Uh, Wilcox and Catcher. He's selling uh, corn, dollar forty uh, for a bag. Uh, I guess this is oysters. Seven twenty-eight. Half peck of oysters, twenty cents. Another bagger. We sell a lot of corn. Okay, this is a chest of scrapbook. So we were talking about people keeping these. Uh, uh, this is our scrapbook. It's about this big. Uh, the the outside is a really nice shape. It's, it's embossed with gold printing and and uh, chromolithograph flowers in it. And this is the inside. The inside, uh, because it's from the 1880s, you can see where the paper is starting to fall apart or on the edges. But this, this is very, very typical of scrapbooks of the period. There were some people uh, who kept scrapbooks meticulously and designed each page uh, with great care. And they're, they're mind boggling because they, got, they don't have ordinary things like this in it. They have really fine printing and they're very detailed and I never see one in the marketplace anymore. But 20, 30 years ago, I used to see one occasionally. They all going into collections and institutions. This is a card from that. It's a Valentine card uh, that was printed with uh, fringe around it. That's in that scrapbook, just a scrapbook. Another typical card that's in that scrapbook, but this one is for Glenwood Ranges and Power Stoves. As by a company in Middletown, Connecticut. So whenever anybody, anyone went to a store, they would find these on the counter so they could pick up. This is a, this is actually a very nice one, it's a Santa Claus. Uh, 1880s, very patriotic motifs to a, a lot of printed material. This is for American Eagle Tobacco Works. Uh, now you can see that, get this red up here, it printed beyond the edge of the defined border because when it was designed, it was uh, inaccurately registered on the on that way. Uh, Chester, this is interesting. Dr. Fred Sumner Smith, MDD, for four visits at a dollar a visit, four dollars. <laughs> Plus two office calls at 50 cents a call. And 40 cents worth of medicine for a total of five bucks. Uh, another uh, local Chester piece, this is on the back of a witch hazel bottle. Now, witch hazel, you know, it was a cure-all, and these, these people are still in, in business, right? Yes. And it cures accidents, injuries, wounds, bruises, burns, toothaches, 
face ache, whatever face ache, neuralgia, rheumatism, tumors, gathered breasts, sore throat, varicose veins, insect stains, sunburn, and particularly recommended for the blind. Oh, well, that's the blind bleeding and itching piles. Don't leave me sleeping. This is, this is part of a, of a, a group of material is known as crack medicine. So you find all kinds of medicine through all the periods that say they can, they can uh, cure from you know, cancer to you know, make your hair not gray anymore. Uh, this is for another uh, medicine. And, uh, this is for acid phosphate especially recommended for dyspepsia, mental and physical exhaustion, <laughs> seasickness, nervousness, etc. And this, this piece is about eight inches. And I don't know why they chose to put a dog in a clamshell, but <laughs> it has a lot of high appeal. This is a, a chest of piece uh, certifying that uh, Mr. H.C. Daniels in Chester is registering his dog named Gip Small, a rat terrier, black, in 1891. There's a whole collecting field of dog tags from you know, historic dog tags. And dog licenses. This guy was paying, uh, yeah, license fee of $6 in 1896. <laughs> and 15 cents. Isn't that something? Wow. Russell Jennings. Well, this is, this is what we often call a trade catalog, although it's just a folder. But it shows what he's making, uh, just a sample of it. And on the back, there's more material. Bits and braces, and this is a very nice condition. Some more Russell Jar Jennings products. I had this is not just I had to include it. It says all sinks, cesspools, wells, cellars emptied during the day or night without offense or danger of explosion. <laughs> Mr. Gizmo is doing it with a big barrel of you know what. <laughs> this is a Chester piece. It's an invitation to a masquerade of fancy ball uh, by the quiet young fellows. Does anybody know who they were? Rob? 1885, at the Chester Town Hall, Thursday evening, the 5th, music by Colts Orchestra, O. Craig Smith Prompter, 7.45 o'clock to 8.30. What? Wow. Concert box, yeah, yeah, the concert box. Right here. Grand March at 8.30. Tickets one dollar. <coughs> <laughs> this is a funny one I recently got. Reception of ball for the Elite Head Waiters Association. <laughs> this is in New York City, 1819. Now, this is curious. There's a receipt for in Chester. It's for ice, the Chester Ice Company. But You'll see right here, it says for 2,800 pounds of ice, 25 cents a pound, $700. Now who's using, Carl Watkins is using 2,800 pounds of ice for what? He wasn't, he wasn't a mortician, was he? A digger? <laughs> No, because I, I thought so too, but look here, it's 2,800 pounds at 25. Well, 25 cents at 2,800 pounds. 
pounds is $700. Mm -hmm. you, you could convince me differently, but it seems to be what it says, although it's. Now, he was a vet, so he probably had the bandwidth on ice. Bandwidth on ice? Yeah. It was our great grandfather. Yeah. yeah. It's curious. This is in a Chester office. I don't know who they are, but it is dated. Oh. It is dated 1913. Bates Factory. Oh, Bates? Bates Factory? Interesting. It's photography. This is a photograph. Yeah, it's a photograph. Is photography ephemera? Uh, yes. Smith and Kelsey Garage. I know I have to Smith, but he got, he got knocked off there. But right here it says relining a transmission $3.25, grinding the valves $2.50, labor on a spring $0.75. Cents. Seems like a lot of work, $13. And that's dated 1827. Nice guy. This is a close-up of the services they were given. Changing a tire, 75 cents. <laughs> so I think this is a riot. Okay. This is a uh, an insert, which means it's a thin piece of paper that was inserted in a box of whatever it was that you were buying, and it says it's for Five cent package peanuts, half dime brand, hundred packages, three seventy five. A present in every package for boys and girls, and something for you too. In every, you too, you too as the proprietor. And look what the proprietor gets in every package. <laughs> now, this it says. Free to you, this beautiful revolver, nickel plated, double action, regular hammer with bounding lock, rubber handle, 32 caliber with six shots. Can be easily resold for $2.75. <laughs> <laughs> One revolver with every case of half dime packaged peanuts. <laughs> This is a, a, a very small item. It says the Princess Theater, Chester, Connecticut. I don't know what it's from. Rob, can you tell us where it's from? What it, Fort Water Street is now? Fort Water Street. Fort Water Street? Yeah, it's a stone building. Stone building. That was upstairs, right? Yeah. 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 This is a really nice photograph. It's, it's of a family, probably 1890s done with a glass plate, having a picnic mm -hmm. in, a, in a field. <clears throat> it's just a great image. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a, again, a chest of photograph. Uh, this couple is admiring a dog here, who's has got a very admirable face, I gotta tell you, but he's a nice dog. And here's a chest of coon hunters. There's a lot of dead coons up there. Three dogs. Some of them are holding their rifles or a shotgun, I guess they are. And actually, as if you notice, there's a couple of stunts. Really? What's the dog's name? Yeah. He raised all kinds of dogs. So Did it? Yeah. Interesting. And so that's both of them. And this is, this is what skunks get from palling around with raccoons. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes there were foxes up there. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I thought this, this photograph is, uh, is really nice because it shows 
uh, period when a big change is happening with automobiles coming out of the farm. And it says, if I can read it right, hotel up here. It says, hotel, livery stable. Richardson Brothers? Uh, something very close to that. So people were very proud of their vehicles and their stock in the steer here. And a young horse here. Yeah. Now, this is, this is a great photo. Not in great shape, but uh, it's in your, your collection. And on it, it shows the photographic views. Now this says, although it's cut off, but I can tell it means that uh, ambrotypes and tintypes. So what would happen, these itinerant photographers would go around and take photos of anything and everything, farms, stores, kids or whatnot. Then they would go in their wagon and would develop them and they'd sell them for a penny a piece to the, you know, their the subjects. And there's a great book on that, uh, right here, if you can see it, on uh, uh, photo postcards. It's a very highly, highly collected area. Good photo postcards sell for a lot of money, and they're very hard to find out because they've been, they've been collected probably for 90 or 100 years. But it's surprising if you, if you take a chance to look through this book, for some of the images are just terrific. Okay, Chester Drum Corps, Fair, Wahoo! Season ticket, November 12, 1888. And on it, it says, this ticket entitles the holder to one chance in a Rochester lamp. That's it, a Rochester lamp. What was, what was uh, new and interesting about this lamp is the first lamp to have a round wick. So it's a cylindrical wick. Yeah. And <laughs> Chester Connect has a woven wire bed. I don't know how comfortable it is, but the, in the in other advertising is, it says the most, the most durable and elastic bed in the world. I guess it's not gonna wear out. <laughs> Just a sanitary laundry. You know, there's a great photograph, which I, I didn't have access to, of the laundry facility with a lot of ladies in white dress posing inside the laundry. Wet wash, all clothes, were, all clothes returned dead. See? 15 pounds for 75 cents. Over five pounds, five cents per pound for excess. Now, at the same time, talking about laundry, there was a invention called the Empire Ringer. Is that Empire Ringer here? Now it says here, the lady saying to the gentleman, I hope I don't intrude, excuse me, the man saying to her, I hope I don't intrude. And she says, oh no, with this new Empire Ringer, I can work and talk at the same time. <laughs> Clothes are just falling out of there. He's got this there. Right there, there. Folding themselves right into the laundry. You know, on the back of the card, it says what they what they excel in the greatest. Warranty to give satisfaction. Chester, Connecticut, for sale by Julius Smith. Anybody know who Julius Smith was? West Main Street. West Main Street. It's all straight road. Right? Now this next piece is a piece of mine. Uh, it's kind of self-explanatory. It's the Imperial Laundry. And in the middle you'll see it says, we wash for white people only. Now this is probably from the next. No, it's, it's uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, 
Uh, this is probably from the 1930s. No laundry can make a collar fast forever, but any laundry that is careful and conscientious can make sure that all your collars won't become sore edged or broken. So, people, they're enticing people to use their business, but they're fearful that obviously laundry is being done by, from other races. There is, uh, every time we do a show, there are institutions that come asking for this kind of material. And we have a book of this, just of racial interest. Probably gets the most traffic of any yeah. any of the other books we have. Can you do the time of that? Hmm? Can you do the year? 1930s. Yeah. Uh, this is called a store cot, and they were hung, see the two holes here? They are hung in the store, in the window, for people to see. And this is advertising Minsky, but more importantly, it's showing like the perfect domestic yeah. situation, clean table, lots of food, drink, and Minsky pie being the subject. This is a great piece of lithography, total chromo lithography. Everything is right on. The colors are very saturated. This is another uh, chromo lithograph. It's a label. So I cut round, and on it it says, beware of imitations. It is for a paper bucket. Syracuse Paper Wire Company. We make the only pressed seamless paper, paper, paper pail in the world. And it's really great with art. Oh. I bought this years and years ago on eBay. And then I sold it to somebody. And then I was so upset that I sold it. I bought it back twice the price I sold it. <laughs> and I was lucky she was, she was a dealer. I was lucky she, she sold it. It's for a funeral home that's run by this black family. It says, Fred Anderson, a friend to the community, Charles A. Anderson, and future funeral director, and Mrs. Fred Anderson, assistant, takes care of all ladies and children. Now, they're really proud of this uh, car, the flower car they have. And below it, it says, this flower car is the first one to be owned by our race in the city. It is at your service on all funerals where it's needed to protect your floral designs without pressure. This flower car is undoubtedly the most beautiful one in the city, equipped with musical chimes. There's a, there's a book on uh, African-American Human practice, the establishment of the business in America, and it's, it's really a fascinating book. I'm sorry, I can't remember the title of it. It's, uh, it, it gives you a, uh, an appreciation for the coming up of black men and women in an industry that there weren't any black funerals around. Excuse me, do you have those cars that are still in existence? The cars? Oh, I suppose they are. This is, by the way, this is a fan. So this would be given out at the funeral home to keep cool. So they have advertising on, on both sides. So our prices are from $45 to 1000 This means that any price within this range, we have it to offer. So we'll pay you to visit our showroom and see what we have to offer before going elsewhere. And again, they say, we have the first chime musical verse in the city. If you have not heard it, you should hear it. <laughs> it costs a little more to have the best. Okay, Cedar Lake Pleasure Club. This is an orchestra playing at Cedar Lake. Two clarinets, two violins, a trumpet, a drummer. John Mayer, Roland Lind, Henry, 
Roland Lynn Henry. That's one word, one name. Right? Oh, okay, all right. John Mayer Roland. Is that the last name, Mayer Roland? Is that, the, is that the last name here, Mayor Roland? No, John Mayer. John Mayer Roland Lyons. Yeah, Henry Arthur Morey and Bill Stalin. Oh, Stalin. Well, it's a concept, I guess. Well, this photograph is really in great shape. It's great tonality, very nice. Now, I'm not sure, this is obviously inside of Chester. Uh, Shop. I can't tell what they're doing, but it's all women. Yeah. One man in the center. They look like paper boxes lined up. Yeah. Thin ceiling. There is a real, real nice interior view. Interior views are very sought after. <laughs> Did you know the Spencers? Rest of Holiday Wishes, Spencer, 1939 to 1940. Every year they did a, a special Christmas card. And here they are, Hugh and Ellen Spencer, in their buggy, 1951. Lived up on Pratt Street, I'm told. years ago I bought this on eBay. It says, a night and in San Quentin. A night in San Quentin. And it's printed with stencils. The inside is a key. <laughs> and it says, June 9th, 1949, arrived at 6.15 p.m. Warren, Morton Clinton Duffy invites the movie colony to attend. A night in San Quentin. Food, tour, Ex entertainment, bring this invitation with you. It will get you in and get you out. I, I had a collection of invitations that sold to an institution, but I was, I was really wanted to keep this out, so I slipped it out at the last minute. They don't have it. I do. Oh, what is this? It's got a nice picture of a German Shepherd with a very fancy collar. It's kind of that Gibson, Gibson girl era. It's about ten inches across. It's a chocolate box. So when you bought a, a chocolates from this particular firm, you get this box, which was also inlaid with a decorated uh, felt. And the box is about this deep. Now, you wouldn't think that chocolate boxes would be very interesting. But I have a friend in Colorado who has about 600 of them. And they would knock their socks off. The, the, the ingenuity in uh, the creation of chocolate boxes I went out there to photograph them for them, so I got to see each one. Mechanical wheels, you know those? Uh, used to turn the, turn the wheel on the side here, and then the windows would pop up. You know, different information. So this one is by uh, Swiss, who are making a, a, a Swiss uh, sausage. Some kind of meat combination. Anyways, these are uh, very futuristic. Meaning it's like 1950s, and there's, they've got rockets in them and going into space. And this is from Earth to the closest approaching to the uh, closest approach to Pluto. Yeah. Uh, there's a book. Uh, you never. You may not think what the hell these things are. They have these, this book that was written by Jessica Helfand, and she is a doctor from Yale, and she collected 800 of these things. And, and uh, 
gave them to Yale and provided the library. And uh, if you page through this book, you'll be shocked about the, the ingenuity of wheel designs. These are not new. They go back to the 1500s, mm -hmm. 1500. Not in this country, but in Europe. And they were called Bovells, B-O-L-V-E-L-L-V-S. And they were often printed in books, uh, a lot of times about astronomy. And they had these incredibly detailed, complicated wheels in the book that would uh, tell you about the, the sky or uh, the latest technology. And it was great. Oh. 1940s. During the war, we must all help to prevent this. What it says on the inside is that if you keep the lights on in your house at night, you're going to expose the silhouette of American ships to enemy submarines. And it goes into great warnings on the inside about this. I've only ever seen this, this one and none of them is even like it. <laughs> stickers. Stickers. Stickers are ephemeral. Right? When a baby makes the bucks. And another Chester. Now, these are both designed by the goods. Yeah. And they were the makers of tons of great ephemera. The goods. And before they left town here, the building, they were giving it all away. Mm -hmm. It was fabulous. Oh, Chester Baseball Association, 1895. This ticket's issued to FC Daniels is good for four admissions to games on the home grounds. And that leads into next week's. <laughs> Next, yeah, next week's uh, Sunday, September 22nd, at the Vic Field, Deep River, the all time baseball game played by rules of 1857. And I, I gather the, the baseball players are in guard of the period. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a poster, and that's it. Yeah.